Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format at FunkinStuff.net and on YouTube. Truth and Rhythm can now also be enjoyed on the go as audio podcast edition from FunkinStuff.net, iTunes, and other leading providers. I'm your host, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine, musicologist and author of... And it was around here somewhere. Everything is on the one, the first guy to funk. If you don't have your copy, you better get it from Amazon now. All right, whether you're watching or listening, as always, I thank you very much for your continued support. You're going to be paid off handsomely for that support today because my guest is jazz, R&B, and funk percussionist, composer, producer, and activist, James M. Tume. From 1971 to 1975, he was a member of Miles Davis's group that also included bassist Michael Henderson, organist Lonnie Liston-Smith, and guitarist Reggie Lucas, whom M. Tume would work with on numerous future projects. Among his many albums with Miles was 1972's uh, Funk Jazz Landmark on the Corner. There's a picture of it there, later reissued in this fantastic expanded six CD collection. M. Tume also worked with many of the jazz giants of the era, including McCoy Tyner, Don Cherry, Art Farmer, Sonny Rollins, Herbie Hancock, and Gatto Barbieri, among others. He also later released three avant-garde jazz LPs under his own name in the 1970s that include collaborators like Ndugu Chancellor, Gary Bartz, Gene Karn, and D.D. Bridgewater. As a transition into more mainstream music, in 1978, M. Tumay and Lucas teamed up to write the number one R&B duet ballad, The Closer I Get to You, for Berta Flack and Donny Hathaway. That same year, they released Kiss the World Goodbye, the first of what would become five albums credited to him, Tume as an R&B funk band. They scored their biggest hit with the throbbing mid-tempo, mid-tempo funker, Juicy Fruit, which topped the R&B chart in 1983. Fronted by the powerful presence of singer Tawatha Eiji and Tume notched 11 charted singles between 1978 and 1986, including Give It On Up, you, Me, and He, and Breathless. But also deeper, funkier tracks like Just Funnin', Green Light, I Simply Like, and Hip Dip, Skip the Beat that really captivated me as a loyal follower. Concurrently, the M. Tume Lucas combination produced and wrote hits for other artists, including Phil Hyman and Stephanie Mills, winning a Best R&B Song Grammy for the latter's 1980 hit, Never Knew Love Like This Before. James and Toomey subsequently became involved with film and TV music, including New York Undercover from 1994 to 1999, and went on to become a talk radio personality and public speaker. Oh, and by the way, as a teen, he was a highly successful uh, competitive swimmer. <laughs> Friends, what we're talking about here is a multi-talented and outspoken man who has packed as many as a half dozen careers into a single lifetime. <laughs> far from done pursuing new horizons so with all that james i gotta say how's it feel to be such an underachiever <laughs> oh man first of all i appreciate very much your invitation for me to partake in our dialogue man and uh i hope that your listeners today you know can can walk away with something after we finish but thank you very much for the invitation man oh absolutely it's an honor to be here with you today longtime fan and um you know, I think uh, you're, are you in uh, Jersey? Is that where you are? Yes, sir. Jersey. Yeah, yeah. So that's all good. And uh, it's, uh, it's been so great to see you uh, being uh, more visible lately. Oh. <laughs> you know? Yeah, at 70. I decided at the end of this, I, 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 I talk, you know, my kids say, look, you're closer to the end than the beginning. So, like, if you leave, you got to leave some information. So it's important for me to be here because I, when my son uh, texts me, your 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 uh, your site. You know, I went through them, and as I told you earlier before we started, I said, "Okay, you talking to all the cats? You know what I mean? Not just those there, but the cats that are part of the mixture." You know. Yeah, well, we're dedicated to it. So, thank you so much for being part of that. Thank you. Um, so, you prefer I call you James, or I'm Two May, or what? Two Yeah. Cool. All right. So, I got to tell you, you know. Um, the Closer I Get to You was like mm. the, the soundtrack to my love life in high school. So, right. you know, I mean, whether it was uh, Roberta's version or the one on, you know, your album, I mean, it was so good. 
So much appreciated. Oh, thank you very much. You, but you know, if, if, if it's all right with you, uh, usually there's a story behind every 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 song. I, I, if you if you got a minute, I'd like to tell you the impetus and what really happened with the the closer I get to you, almost didn't make the album. But what happened was Roberta invited me to the listening session at the uh, at the studio, and in comes Ahmed Erdogan, who was the president of Atlantic, and uh, they played the whole album, you know, the Blue Lights in the Basement, and this is true. Ahmed said, I like everything on here except the closer I get you. He actually said it. I'm just sitting there. He did, I, I wasn't even introduced, you know? And uh, I always give Roberta Flack this credit. She fought to keep the closer I get to you on the album. Hmm. And when he said, okay, okay, he relented. And then he said, okay, we can keep it on. But you know what? It'll never be a single. Okay? So... Ergo, you know, if I ask you this question, what was the first single off the Blue Lights in the Basement? Can't remember. It wasn't the closer. It was a song called the 24th of December. I said, well, that'll be over on the 25th. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's that goes to show you. I mean, I've heard so, there's so many stories like that, you know, yeah, where the, the higher ups, you know, Almost they just have, on, man. yeah, they just don't get it. But um, yeah, this is one of the songs that every time I hear it, still, it just kind of evokes that sort of feeling and memory from 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 then you know it's it's a special special song um and that year i mean you also came out with kiss or roll goodbye we'll get into that more later but i just wanted to mention that because that was you know right in that zone for me when i was about 16 or so and you know well, right, feel, right, right. feeling it all you know and uh, so it meant a lot to me so you know and to me it meant a lot to me and you know I'm <laughs> that's good i like that <laughs> So let's roll back a little bit, though, and, and, and start from, you know, uh, your upbringing. I know you came from a musical family. Yes, sir. Um, talk a little bit about that, uh, coming up in Philadelphia, how you got into music, and, and how you got into swimming. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I always start off with this. You know, my biological father is Jimmy Heath of the uh, incredi incredibly gifted and honored Heath brothers family. You know, Jimmy, saxophonist, world-renowned composer. Uh, my uncle Percy, world-renowned bassist, and my uh, other uncle uh, Tutti Kumba, world-renowned drummer. Uh, the father that raised me at that time was a, uh, a man by the name of James Hengage Foreman, who was also uh, an, an exquisite pianist. So uh, he played with Bird and, uh, you know, Prez, you know. As a matter of fact, uh, Dinah Washington is my sister's uh, godmother. Uh, so I came up around, like I, I always tell people, at the dinner table, and I'm nine, ten. Sometimes it'd be Dizzy Gillespie. Another Sunday, maybe there's John Coltrane, there's Thelonious Monk, uh, there's Lalo Schifrin. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and pretend I knew how deep that was, Scott. But I knew I was around something special. You know, and I was also growing up at the same time that the explosion of R&B. I'm, I'm growing up listening to Youssef, Youssef Latif and Frankie Lyman. And there's also the creation of Motown. This is what we're talking about the early 60s. And um, so I've always had this, this wonderful, it's not even a dichotomy, a dialogue. I mean, coming up in jazz and also coming up in R&B and, and having an equal appreciation for both. Well, I was, I was a very fortunate experience to have as a kid. Wow, that's amazing to have so much music all around you. Wow. Can you imagine? I'm, I'm, I can read. And, and then sometimes when the cats would be in, in, in New York, I mean, in Philly, they would actually stay at the crib. Like Sonny Stitt would always live there for that week when he was working either Peps or the Showboat or Barry Harris, a great pianist. He played with the Cannonball and also with uh, Youssef. These cats would stay at the house. As a matter of fact, it was Barry Harris that really led me into pursuing the keyboards. You know, as I was playing piano at like 12, 13. But my main uh, bones were cut as a percussionist in my jazz uh, front ground. I don't call it jazz as my background. Jazz is my front ground. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of, do you remember in the mid 70s that Mean Joe Green commercial where he threw the towel? Oh, yeah, the yeah. I'm right, thinking right, of these right. like jazz greats tossing you, you know? Yeah, yes, right, yeah. And I was about that kid's age, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a great analogy, man. I like that. Yeah, wow. That's something else. So um, how did you gravitate towards uh, percussion, though, specifically? Well, when I was about 
around the time I was picking up the keyboards, well, keyboards back then was acoustic piano, you know, <laughs> it wasn't even a, an electric piano. Uh, my uncle Kumba bought me a kunga. And uh, I always say this, Scott, there's three components to the creative process. Intuition, intellect, and technique. Now, what do I mean by that? You don't know why you were drawn to do what you do. There was something here that drove us. A singer doesn't know why they want to sing. A painter doesn't know why they want to paint. A poet doesn't know why they want to write poetry. It's an intuitive thing. As we get into that, we develop an intellectual appreciation for what we're pursuing. And then at the end of the day, it's about your technique, time served. You're only as good as the hours you put into honing your craft. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, it, we went down a nice road. Um, now what did you ask me, actually? How you gravitate toward percussion. Well, yeah, I gave you that, yeah. And, and I was drawn to that. And then later on, when I went to school in Pasadena on a, on a swimming scholarship, I met this gentleman or ran into him named Big Black, who was an exceptional percussionist. He was playing with uh, Dizzy Gillespie at the time. And uh, I loved what his technique was because I was never in what you call Afro-Cuban kind of guy. I mean, my heroes was Elvin Jones and Tony Williams. So I was trying to translate their drumming, trap drumming tra uh, technique to the hand drums. And, um, you know, that's how, like I said, I cut my bones in jazz, you know. I started with McCoy, then Freddie Hubbard. And while I was with Freddie Hubbard, that's when Miles came to hear me at the Village Vanguard. And he called me, said, what you doing for the next four months? I said, whatever you want. He said, well, we're going to Europe, pack your bags. And I was like, oh, okay, that's how that started. Wow. But that was the most amazing part of my musical experience. You can only imagine standing next to him for almost five years. Oh, absolutely. So how does, you know, forgive my ignorance if, if there is, but how does, uh, you know, fundamentally playing percussion in a jazz context differ from playing it in the R&B or funk context? Well, that's a very inter interesting question, and that's never been quite posed to me like that. Uh, because actually, when I made the transition to start recording my own songs and with, 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 with Reggie and I as partners for other acts, when I decided to do the M2 May band, I never played percussion again. Other than, you know, uh, I was playing all keyboards, you know. But I think they require two different sensibilities. And uh, like I said, Miles Davis, being with him was the perfect canvas for me. Because what Miles did is give everybody a canvas, and then you got to bring your own paints. He never told any of us what to play. And it was interesting, you don't mind if I just, tap into that one the corner album. Oh, please do, it's a favorite. Man, look, man, when we did that record, it was dogged. Everybody said Miles had lost his mind. He had, you know, it's the worst, worst stuff ever recorded. And as you know, now that's looked at as an historic, you know, a turn in the music. And- um, Hold that. Sure. Uh, oh, man, yeah. Yeah, that, oh, goodness. I've never seen that. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful, man. I don't mean because I made it, but that was that was more than a, a, a guy that I'm playing for. That was like, you know, father-son mentor, you know. Um, and I just understood so many lessons that he told me. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> we were in Europe. It was my first tour. And he would let me close the show with a solo. You know, I'm playing little all that, or everything I thought was the hippest stuff in the world. Little, little, and look, standing ovation at the end. And I'm walking off the stage like puffed, you know what I mean? And somebody walks up behind me. That wasn't shit. And my whole balloon just, and I turned around and it was Miles. He said, stop playing what you know. Start playing what you don't know. Now, first of all, I gotta navigate, what does that mean? Then I dug it. Stop going down that same street. You use other avenues to get to that, that destination. So I, it's almost like you got to unlearn everything you learn. You also told me things like, what you don't play is more important than what you play. He said, space is sound. Don't finish everything. Leave some room. And uh, just terribly important lessons that I could apply later in contemporary popular music. So 
first off, why, why do you think that this particular record was sort of overlooked at the time? You know, what was what was going on or not going on at that time that, that caused that to happen? That's a great question. My feeling was, having gone through that period, there was an interesting dynamic that was happening with Miles. Miles was leading the way in transition. I remember one time we had a conversation and he told me, you can't create new music without having access to new sounds. And he said, that's what electronics brings. I mean, let's really think about it. I told somebody once, the 440 tune piano was the first synthesizer. It made everything okay. It brought everything into perspective. I'm sure there were some harpsichord players walking around talking about they ain't keeping it real. Okay, but the point is, that was his choice. Now, first of all, electronics wasn't new. Sun Ra had been doing it for years before that. But there was a, a, a resistance to all and many of the critics who looked at Miles as the darling until he went electronic. And they called it like sellout. What was sellout about on the corner? He was exploring new planets and new dimensions. But I always say this. Some people say you have to wait for a new generation of, of people to appreciate what you're doing. No. We knew there were sold out audiences every night. Young people. The people we had to wait to die off was old critics. Mm -hmm. Okay? And when you look at and I always say, thank God for you too. Because now young people can see what that band is doing. And sometimes just for nostalgia's sake, I'll go on just to watch some of those old clips. And the responses are unbelievable from young people. Like, what the hell were the critics talking about? What this is new music. Mm -hmm. And I'll just, I'll just say this, with, with all the pride I can muster, there's never been a band before or, or since that explored music in that particular context, in that particular way. Great musicians, I mean, Pete Cozy, unsung, Al Foster, great drummer. Dave Liebman was great, Carlos Garnett before him. But we explored the universe down a path that no one had done before that. And the critics, in many aspects, resented it. Also, Miles was becoming more political. If you look at all those post-73, you see all the speakers, because we were doing Japan, and Yamaha was just getting into instruments. And Miles said, I want uh, the sound system to have red, black, and green colors. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were like, uh, what does that say? Well, it didn't say nothing. It just means that's how you feel it. It's showing some pride. Yes. But how dare you? Okay, <laughs> but it was miles, and then we felt a lot of that resentment, you know, had had other political overtones. But that band was a band of warriors. You had to be, you had to be. It's it's funny, uh, and to me talking to you, you know, and thinking about that era, you know, even not just in jazz, but if you look at even like rock, say like the Led Zeppelin or even oh. Black Sabbath. I mean, they were they were demonized and vilified and, and, and just shredded by critics. Right. And now, and now look at the legacies. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it amazes me the distance between what the people are ready to digest and what the interpreters of what the people should digest, how far and wide that gap is. And, that, and I don't know if you've ever seen that, seen this, but, after 30 years, I decided to, to I was asked to debate uh, a jazz critic, Stanley Crouch, I said, it's on YouTube. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it was on the electric period of Miles. And yeah. for the first time, he had to rumble with somebody who not only knew, but also could vocalize. Yeah, I think you can be declared the winner of that debate. Oh, no, I, mean, I, I don't want to be the arbiter of that, <laughs> but I'll just say it's available, available for those that want to see. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so talk to me about what it was like just being part of, of that group and that entity. Um, what was it like when you went in the studio? And, and, and what was that experience like? Well, the first album, you know, as, as you so correctly pointed out, I joined Miles the year before we did On the Corner uh, on that European tour, and that's when it was Keith Jarrett on piano, or keyboards. Michael was on bass, and Dougal Chancellor on drums, uh, Gary Bartz, and uh, he had another, it was, it actually were two percussionists on that tour, Don Elias. After that tour, Miles said, well, you're playing enough for two guys, so I'm just keeping you. Um, 
Here's a, here's a session. You never knew when a session was going to happen. I remember one session I walked in, and Miles just handed out uh, uh, the lead sheets, and he gives me mine, and he gives mine has obviously the time signatures written out, but everything's written out in colors. Keyboard players given. So say you're getting your, your lead sheet, and maybe one of the chord changes is B flat to A flat minor. You would have colors, and I asked him, okay, what, what? he said, man, you're, here's a 5-4, I want that played in blue. Here's 4-4, four, four, I want you to play that in red. So I said, what do you mean? He said, what do you mean what I mean? How does red feel in 4-4? Four, four? So that's the kind of, like I said, Zen lessons. So you, I began to digest and understand chords are not just notes, they're colors. Time and rhythm. So I used to learn for myself how to play time signatures against times. I know we're getting a little deep, but if I, if, we, if, if, if we're in 5-4, I mean 4-4, four, four, and I was playing 4-4, four, four, I would play 7 against 4. That's what made everything so organic. And he let a percussionist take leads in, in setting the rhythm and, and the time signature. That had never been done. The picture you showed, he's got a percussionist standing next to him. Usually, you know, the percussionist is in the back, next to the, the, the trap room, but no. We were, we were on a deep vibe, and I, I began to understand how to anticipate what he would play before he played it. Wow. So, you know, Miles is such a, a giant, um, but also such an enigma. So can you speak at all to maybe a, a experience or memory or two that you had? You know, how close did you get to him as a, as a person, as a man? Very close. We talked all the time. I mean, our conversations would always happen two, three, four in the morning because he was an insomniac and so am I. So he would call and we'd have these discussions. I'll show you how close the relationship was. Um, right after on the corner, Miles was in a car accident and he broke both his ankles. Uh, his girlfriend called me one day and said, Miles needs you to come over right away. I didn't know what it was, but I, you know, of course I shot right over because I would go over there a lot because we would have musical conversations and Miles, would, Miles was a great cook. And I'd go over there to just degrees on the food. But this time he had, uh, he had mixed some of his you know, prescribed medications with other medications and he was in a, a, an altered state. And he asked me to take him to the hospital. You know, we went there and uh, you know, everything checked out all right, but he had re-injured his ankles. Uh, closeness was another time I was at, at, at the home and his mail came. I was in, in another room and I, all I heard him say was, oh shit. And I said, I thought something had happened. I said, Miles, what's up? He hands me a letter. I opened it up. It's a Christmas card. It was from Duke Ellington, mm -hmm. but it wasn't Christmas. And you know what Miles said? That's the hippest thing. He said, that means he's dying. Duke sent all the guys Christmas cards. Huh. I mean, you can't, I can't even make that kind of stuff up. You know, so to answer your, your question long and short, we were very close. I'll give you one example of how shrewd he was and how much he knew how to tweak things to enhance the music. We're in, uh, in Spain. We played a gig in Spain. And I remember doing, we had two sets. So we, we, after the first set, I'm in the room with Miles in his dressing room. Gary Bars comes in. I mean, I rate, screaming, man, I don't like, I don't want Keith, play, I, don't, I hate what he's playing under me. I don't like the way he's comping. I mean, Miles, tell him to lay out. I don't want him playing while I'm soloing. And so I'm, I'm sitting there, wow, this is deep. So as soon as Gary leaves, Miles tells the, the uh, road manager, go get Keith. Well, manager goes get Keith. Keith comes in. Miles sits back. Man, Keith, Gary loves everything you're playing. As a matter of fact, he wants you to play more. <laughs> now, dig this. The next set, the clash and the energy was like, I'm like, these cats are getting ready to fight. But it was the deepest music I ever heard. And neither one of them knew what Miles had told the other one. <laughs> he knew to tweak the music for some anxiety, and, you know, and, and pressure. And just, just genius, man. Genius. 
Uh, did, did Miles seem to care much about what critics said or, you know, Ooh, what anyone thought about? Absolutely critics? not. And that was the lesson I learned. It's not about what people say. It's about what you believe in terms of what you're doing. Because the only person that can shake your confidence is you. Dig it. Does it matter what anybody says about your show? If you believe what you're doing is on the right path? No. The only people that get shook are those that don't have faith in what they're doing. I mean, I caught a lot of help from a lot of the jazz cats. I had one cat, I won't mention the name, came up to me and said, man, you ought to be ashamed of yourself that you're doing this kind of music. Now, I'm like, I made a diff I always made a distinction, man, between adaptation and metamorphosis. You adapt when you're just trying to be into something. Metamorphosis is that you actually evolve. Because a lot of people will say, those, those, you mentioned those, those albums that I did, Al Cable Line, uh, Kawaii, and Rebirth Cycle. Those are actually avant-garde acoustic jazz records. I didn't try to write The Closer. I began to evolve. And actually, the bridge for me was Eddie Henderson. When I left Miles, Eddie Henderson, I did a couple of albums with him. Like Juicy Fruit was not my first sample by a rapper. Jay-Z was my first uh, sample. It's a, it's a record called Coming of Age on his first album, uh, Reasonable Doubt. I just followed what I was feeling. I never sat down on my right a hit record. Never. Never. It's just well, the conviction. Well, so why, why did you split uh, from Miles? What happened there? Miles yeah. quit. Miles stopped. I'll give you, we were, we were, dig this, man. This is a story that's very, no, very few people know this. Miles was hooked up to do a tour with Herbie Hancock. We did two gigs. It was like about a three or four month tour. The second gig, I think, was St. Louis. First gig was in New York at Hofstra. Second gig was in St. Louis. And Miles felt, said he felt ill. He called me to his room. I went, and he said, I think this is it. Look, tiny did anybody know this is it turned out to be five years. <laughs> but that's when he took his hiatus. At that time, Michael Henderson went off to develop his very successful R&B career. And me and Reggie, who had been writing, said, okay, let's like do this. And um, it wasn't about leaving. It was about Miles that made an exit. He didn't play again for five years. So before talking about the M2 Me band, um, yes. On those those records that you put out on your own, the, the uh, jazz records. Yes. Um, what was your aspirations with with those, and and how how did they ma measure up to those aspirations? I felt everything I was doing at that time was honest to what I was hearing. The first one, Al Cable Line, Land of the Blacks, recorded live. The second, no, Kawhi was the first album, which is interesting because it was my uncle uh, Tootie's album. But he called me and said, I want you to write all the music. Uh, so I was like, wow, really? So I'm sitting in there, here's Don Cherry, here's Herbie Hancock, here's my father, Jimmy Eve, Buster Williams, all my idols. And I hear, okay, Herbie, here's the chord changes on this, you know? So it was a great experience. But the third album was uh, an album called Rebirth Cycle. And I felt I had given all that I had to that sound. See, I'm a firm believer in bridge burning. What do I mean by that? Once you cross a bridge, man, burn it. So you don't even have the option of going backwards. If you don't have a rear view mirror, all you can do is go forward. So when I was finished with that, I was finished. And I was doing those albums while I was still with Miles. Mm -hmm. But I was starting to explore contemporary, you know, popular R&B and pop music. I mean, you know, on, on the keyboards and, and, and songwriting. Yeah, now those records are, are highly coveted by collectors. And oh, I mean, yeah. Uh, what do call it? Classics, whatever, <laughs> whatever that means. You know, but uh, I just know that I was honest to the music that I was writing and creating at that, at that time. 
and we kind of glazed over it, I think, but how, how did you come up with the m 2 May name? How did that? Great question. I didn't come up with it. Uh, when, when we got signed to Epic, actually, the, the band, now, can I, can I just give you a, a little step back? The m 2 May band and the m 2 May Lucas production sound was actually the ex Roberta Flat rhythm section. Hmm. Okay, so when we left Roberta, that we got it to Epic, and originally the band was going to be called Mindbender. You know, we were all under the P-Funk influence, you know, and I went there and uh, they said, no, I mean, that's cool, but we want to call, you know, m 2 make And I rejected it. First of all, I knew how hard it is for people to say it, especially back in 1979. Hmm. You know, I still can get, oh, Mr. Mutt, but, you know, and they said, no, here's what you have to understand. Once people remember that name, they'll never forget it. It's nothing to compare it to. And uh, I was like, well, man, I don't know how to take that back to the cats. No, this is not Santana. This is not, you know. And uh, But the cats said, cool. And then there was a guy in Paris, Ely, who ran the, uh, the, the uh, P, um, not PR, the promotion department. He said, and what we'll do, we'll, we'll spell it out phonetically on the record. So it was e M2 made, and right under E-M-T-O-O-M-A-Y. -O -O and that's how people, you know, began to get closer to being able to pronounce it. So it seems like, was there a little bit of a gap between uh, Miles and the jazz life and getting into the Roberta Flack and then your own thing? Was there, was there a gap in there? Well, not really. When Miles, left, when Miles stopped, it was somewhere in 75. Roberta Flack was a huge Miles fan. And everywhere we played, if it was in the area, Roberta would show up. So when I left, I had two, this is very interesting, man. I had two people pursuing me. Roberta to join her band and Joe Zavenu to come and join Weather Report mm. and with him and Wayne. And I waited heavily. And this is what I predicated my decision on. I said, well, Joe and Wayne come out of what I came out of. Miles. I always have to say, out of, out of bitches brew came a lot of other broths. So, but I said with Roberta, and I was always, I was already feeling, you know, this, this, this metamorphosis to write some other kind of stuff. So I decided to join Roberta. And out of that came the close I get to you. And back together again, which ironically, it was in, when we did back together again, man, that was the night Donnie killed us. Mm -hmm. I've lost three friends. I lost Donnie. I lost Phyllis Hyman. And I lost Teddy Pendergrass, all three of whom I worked with. Wow. I know we're covering a lot of history here, man. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, that's what it's about, man. So um, that first uh, M M2 May album, you know, I saw you on the, um, I think it was the Red Bull. Oh, OK, yeah. It was great. That was a great. That uh, was the first, the first full extensive interview I'd ever done about my whole, you know, career. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I recommend that. Highly. Oh, thank you. Um, but in that, I felt like you uh, kind of glazed over a little bit mm. um, this okay. first album. And and I don't want to give it short shrift because, you know, I'm here to tell you that that first record, which obviously had some P-Funk influence and all that. Oh, yes. Kiss the World Goodbye. Just fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just fun was great. Um, I think that it's one of the lesser known uh, funk gems of that era, you know. Thank so, you. Um, you know. How, how did that come together and, you know, were you disappointed it didn't go over bigger or where was your head at with that? Well, that's a great, you know what, that's a great question. No one's ever asked me that. Uh, well, first of all, the main joy for me out of that was that that record introduced to Watha, A.G., to the world in terms of the, the, the astounding vocalist that she is. How'd you uh, meet her? I met, met to Watha. Reggie and I both, the first uh, demo we ever did, uh, there was a, a, a woman by the name of Louise West, who was, was a, a, she's a lawyer, and she was teaching at Howard. And I knew her from back in the day when I was Strata East. And she called me, she said, I'm too mate. I got, there's a group here that I'm representing. Why don't you come down and hear them and see if we can do a, a demo. In that group was Tawatha, Angela Wimbush, 
Hey, 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 Twilight, who's the, 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 the uh, Rich, Richard Smallwood, who's like a huge uh, gospel writer and, and, and has a wonderful career. So all these talents were in this one group. And then I heard Tawatha there. And because I lived in Newark, I, I, I left her. I said, here's my phone number. She was about to graduate. I said, when you graduate, you know, give me a call. You know, me and Reggie trying to, you know, trying to get some, you know, some things happening. So when she graduated, she called. And we were just working on little minor projects. And then when we put the band together, it was like, it was a, it was no, it was a no-brainer. But to get back to that album, also one of my favorite songs on that album is um, uh, Love Lock, to watch the same. But the album itself, I, I don't wanna, I'm not, I'm not sidetracking your question. I was not disappointed. Scott, because we were doing so many productions at that time. Remember that that album came out in '79 uh, or '78. We the closer it happened, we're doing Stephanie, we're doing Phyllis, we're doing Lou Rawls. You know, so the production end was was was, was doing it. But I also think it was an important album because I'll give you one more thing. I always tell people. The three stages of the creative process is also the three stages of your development. First is imitation. It means that you heard something and you want to sing like that. You want to write like that. You know, you want to do this like that. And that person or that influence is what you work out of. I look at it on your wall behind you. I think it's a funkadelic thing, right? Okay. We were all influenced by P-Funk and Earth Wind so, and, and the jazz. So I, that album was written out of all these influences. The second stage is emulation so you got all these influences but the emulation you're starting to find a little bit of your own signature and if you're lucky enough you get to the third stage which is innovation and by the time we get to juicy fruit that's something nobody had ever heard anything like that but there, that was a work in progress from that first album and if you know about that first album there's a lot of different textures there is even the one song yeah. instrumental is very rock Yes. Uh, Funky Constellation, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm into Led Zeppelin and all them cats. You know, I mean, when I was a kid, man, you know, the Beatles, man, was the world, man. But I'm also listening to James Brown. So it's this confluence of influences, man. So that first album, you don't really know who you are, but you have an idea of what you want to be. Mm hmm so, and I think you took a couple of years and you came back with the next one. And I'm just going to put this uh, <coughs> picture up here for everybody because that's kind of. Oh, uh, yeah. Kind of yeah. see the band members here, sort of. Yeah. Um, but to me, I mean, Tawatha was like some of the most powerful RB lungs, you know, this side of Shaw. Oh, my Khan, goodness. Still you know? is. Matter of fact, we're working on a new uh, project with, with Tawatha. You know, it's time. And then she's played and performed with everybody. I mean, you know. Dave Matthews, Lenny Kravitz, you know, David Bowie. She just did a gig with Aretha Franklin, you know, uh, in New York the other day. So the voice is as pure and as potent as it's ever been. That's great. You know, you know, truth doesn't get no rust. <laughs> you know, yeah. only thing gets rusty is BS. <laughs> well, especially if you take care of it, you know, you don't abuse oh, yeah. the instrument, you know? So, and there's a, uh, I think there's. Oh, Breathless, you mean he? Oh, you mean he? Yeah. Here's some of the covers. Um, so let's talk about, you know, the, the progression. So mm -hmm. you say, you you know, you assimilate and then you get to innovate. So right. along the way before Juicy Fruit, um, tell me about some of those other intermediate steps that you had. I mean, you won a Grammy along the way. So Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't even know where it is because I, I didn't dig it. Why does that make, I mean, let me explain that. <laughs> Back in those days, the R&B and the Black Awards, that's what they were, were given out during the commercial breaks. Yeah. And then when they come back from the commercial, they say, well, earlier this evening, so Never Knew Love wasn't on prime time. They do that now to rap groups, you know what I mean? Uh, earlier this evening for best of this, but I was I very insulted by that. So uh, I don't even know where that thing is. I never, I never it, it, it didn't have any emotional value to me that way, because I didn't like, the context that that happened in. You know, I'm glad people love the music, man, but, you know, I've already, look, the people that love your music, 
I love the fact that they love it. And that's what I always wrote for. I never wrote for fame. I never wrote to, I don't even have a gold record hanging nowhere. They're, they're in a box in the garage somewhere, man. I do, you do have the Kiss and Roll Goodbye record cover back there. Well, right now, I'm, that's, you see where I'm at. I feel like Thelonious Monk with his picture, you know, he kept his piano in the, in the kitchen. This is not where we would initially uh, uh, do this interview. I was gonna be downstairs, you know, in front of a piece of art, you know, but you know, everything works out. But yeah, I, that yeah. gold, there's no gold over here, just pictures. But that happens to be there. I should have took it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, so look, um, talk to me a little bit about what it was like working with some of those great ladies, you know, so oh, Stephanie man. Mills, Phyllis. Yeah. Um, what was it like working with some of them? Well, I always say, as a writer, I believe two things. You have to know, and I touched on this on the, on, on the, the Red Bull thing, what tempo you're most comfortable in. Find your tempo. And I knew my tempo was mid-tempo funk. But I also knew I was more attracted to and felt closer to the female voice rather than the male. Although I've worked with some of the greatest male singers, Donnie, uh, Joe Levert, Eddie Levert, uh, Teddy Pendergrass, uh, did the spinners. But it's something about the female voice, you know, and um, First, it was with Tawatha. No, no, I'm sorry, Roberta. And all these voices are different. Then the Tawatha, Stephanie comes along. The Stephanie Mills album was a personal challenge for me because one of my biggest influences as a writer and producer was Burt Backrack and Hal David. Mm. And a lot of people don't know what you're going to do with my loving was not her first album. Her first album was done by Backrack and David. So I was like, what? How well, she, I, and she she had been on the Wiz as the Oh yeah, but that was Broadway. But she actually recorded yeah. an album. I think it was for Motown. And uh, I went in, back into the album, and I said, "Well, I felt what they did, the mistake that they made, and that's a hard word for me to associate with them because they were like, I mean, I mean, talk about my biggest influence, one of my biggest influences. They they wrote for her like she was Dion, and Stephanie wasn't Dion." Stephanie was something else, you know. Um, and we just wrote out of that context, you know, and I talked to her for, you know, had many conversations. Um, so she had that sound. Phyllis, something else altogether. She had a, a, a tonal center that was unlike anybody else that, that we'd worked with. And Tawatha has that quality too, but Phyllis had it. And plus, plus Phyllis came out of jazz. Mm -hmm. So there was a, and there's an affinity I think we both we both felt. Um, there was another uh, uh, young lady. The album didn't do anything. Her name Rena Scott, who's out of Detroit. She was she was excellent also. She's still around. But I, I'm attracted to the female voice, man. Well, Stephanie was a little powerhouse. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and look, and to this day, just as powerful. Tawath and I went to see her uh, last year, and uh, it's amazing, man. It's amazing. Well, you know, like I said, the truth don't get no rust. You know, she just, bang, knocked it out. So, Timmy, talk to me about this great chemistry you had with Reggie. You know, yeah. how did you guys work together, and uh, why did you eventually go your kind of your own ways? Well, we hooked up, as you said earlier in the introduction, uh, when I was, with, I was already with Miles. Reggie came in when we were doing On the Corner. And then uh, Miles invited him in, in, into the band. So we began the room together, you know, on the road. Now, Reggie was already coming out of contemporary popular music. You know, he was, he was working with Billy Paul, me and Mrs. Jones and, you know, the other stuff. Also, Reggie had a wonderful eclectic for me you know, because he also played avant-garde jazz. He played with Sunrise for a minute, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, and a couple other uh, uh, jazz greats. So my avant-garde jazz thing and his pop, you know, uh, his pop chops, I was actually learning more for my transition into R&B pop. So make a long story short, after we, 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 we had great success, and when you mentioned chemistry, 
I always tell people the thing that keeps chemistry going is success. And I don't mean, just mean economically. I mean, the music you, you, is, is successful in terms of feeding you, your needs, you know, creatively. The separation, we didn't have a fallout. We had what I call a grow out, excuse me. <clears throat> At a certain point, I was no longer hearing the big lush arrangements, you know, strings and horns. And, and, and I was hearing this, what I call a neo-minimalist approach. How can I take a few instruments and blow it up? And I think Reggie was hearing something else. So when we split, it was not like, Reggie went on to do the first Madonna album. I mean, please, okay? I went on to do Juicy Fruit. So neither one of us have a need for an apology. You know what I mean? Uh, it was just that I felt there was a point. I mean, and look, and I don't mean to sound like I, I knew this or thought it, but I just felt there was something I needed to create that was different from any and everything else I ever heard. And that was Juicy Fruit, that album. Yeah. So... Yeah, it's interesting, too, to me that uh, Reggie obviously had a, an affinity, too, with the female singers because yeah, yeah. he went on also on his own to do a lot of them, too. Yeah. So, we had a girl thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can dig it. <laughs> 